Uh, welcome to this EPE event on evaluating sustainable pathways to climate resilience. I'm Anna Vig, a senior evaluator at the GEF, the Global Environment Facility, uh, Independent Evaluation Office, and I will be moderating our discussion today. We will hear about recent experiences from evaluations of EFAD, FAO, and GEF. Our first presenter, S. Nanti Kesan is a lead evaluation officer at the Independent Office of Evaluation of the International Fund for Agricultural Development. He has over 30 years of development and evaluation experience. As the head of the corporate level and the thematic evaluation teams at EFAD and at UNDP, Nanti has conducted several complex evaluations including a recently completed evaluation of EFAD's support to smallholders farmers adaptation to climate change. Our second presenter is Luisa Belli, is an experienced evaluator with a background in tropical and subtropical agriculture and rural so sociology. She has over 20 years of experience in managing monitoring and evalu evaluating development programs of which over 15 years have been spent in the evaluation of agri-food systems and natural resource management interventions. At the FAO Evaluation Office, Luisa currently leads thematic and strategic evaluations and was responsible for the evaluation of the FAO support to SDG 13 Climate Action. And she will be presenting together with Liz Pinero, who is an evaluation analyst supporting strategic evaluations. Liz has a technical background for focusing on environmental and biological sciences, which she combines with evaluation skills to support the assessment of the environmental pillar of sustainable development. She previously worked in academia and the private sector and volunteers for NGOs in her free time. And our final presenter, Anupam Anand, my colleague, is a senior evaluation officer at the Independent Evaluation Office of the JAF. He has over 15 years of experience in evaluation, international development, academic research, and teaching. At the JAF, he has led evaluations on biodiversity, sustainable forest management, and Red Plus, land degradation, fragility, and conflict and illegal wildlife trade. Anupam is currently leading an evaluation on nature-based solutions. We will have all the, present, all the presentations first, and then that will be followed by Q&A and a discussion. Nanti will discuss on lessons from an EFAD evaluation of climate change adaptation and agriculture, followed by Luisa and Lise, who will present on guidance to integrate climate action into FAO evaluations. And finally, Anupam will elaborate on using spatial technology at the GEF to evaluate interventions at the nexus of climate change, conservation, and development. Before we start the presentations, I will hand over to Liz some of your initial reactions to the topic. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. So we will start off this presentation with a small exercise. As part of your regular work, how frequently do you evaluate the support for adapting to climate change? Uh, we have more or less half of you that have participated. And we have an uh, intermediate, um, quite experienced audience today with us. Um, and um, the majority of you uh, have occasionally assessed adaptation uh, to climate change. So this will help us to frame the Q&A session. Thanks a lot for that. And now I hand over directly uh, to Nanti, who will continue with the presentation. Thank you. So greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, thank you so much for lending your ears to what we have to say. Um, as uh, shown by the Mentimeter, clearly at least a fourth of you would probably know much more than what we have to say here. Uh, you will be very familiar with these uh, issues that we uh, bring about. Others 
maybe uh, in a similar situation as us, where we are, uh, our evaluations are grappling with some of the issues um, as we move along and try to build some experience in assessing uh, climate adaptation solutions. So why do we worry about uh, climate adaptation uh, evaluations? Uh, in, the first, uh, for the, in the first part, uh, everyone, I, it's probably there is no one in the planet who watches TV doesn't know that uh, the climate uh, change induced catastrophic events are increasing in frequency and intensity. And uh, it is also equally evident that uh, the most of the burden uh, of this uh, catastrophe is fall on um, the most vulnerable. And in this particular case, a subsection of that will be smallholder farmers who uh, uh, improving their livelihoods and their nutritional status, uh, food security is uh, IFAD's mandate. So IFAD is about a uh, rural agricultural sector as well as uh, improving the lives of small the farmers, and they are particularly affected by uh, the, uh, the consequences of climate change. The other aspect of it, as many of us would know, that uh, the uh, evidence-based solutions for climate adaptation seems to be a much more scarce uh, uh, because it is relatively a young field, for instance, compared to uh, mitigation, it has much less uh, developed uh, solutions and experience and so on and so forth. So it becomes uh, uh, an important part, not only for the sake of IFAD, which uh, declared climate adaptation and climate responses as a priority since 2010, and invested probably in the vicinity of $500 million in climate finance, and it is committed to spending 40% of its uh, programs, uh, program uh, loans and grants uh, to, uh, uh, to climate finance. Uh, so in that sense, it was necessary for us to evaluate the evaluation of this corporate-wide, wherever IFAD has invested in climate, we look at it. So it is not just at one um, uh, farm level or project level, whatever it is, but it, it, it kind of it takes a bird's eye view of the entire intervention of IFAD and see how whether it has helped uh, farm, uh, smallholder farmers uh, or to what extent it has helped or not. So the evaluation approach, I do not want to bore you with details of the entire evaluation uh, uh, progress, uh, how do we avoid the greenwashing and so on and so forth. Perhaps we can take that in the, um, in the question and answer session. But the main two points that we want to bring about, which we think will be relevant to all of us who are evaluating. Um, is the evaluation approaches uh, we need to focus, in our view, on two parts which will be relevant outside IFAD as well. And one is about if we are asking um, whether it is working or not, how do we know what it is working or not? What is the measure here to understand uh, resilience of smallholder farmers, climate resilience of smallholder farmers has changed, to what extent it has changed? to understand that we should have a measure of it. And uh, it turns out that um, there is a very limited or uh, no corporate level uh, understanding of uh, how the resilience is changing. We, of course, will have measure, proxy measures like how many hectares we brought under climate smart agriculture, but that doesn't tell us whether actually the smallholder farmers who are part of this uh, uh, conversion were able to benefit from that or not, whether their vulnerability was reduced or not, that we have no idea, no direct measures to look at that. So that is one aspect. And the second part, of course, is uh, it is not only the intended consequences of agricultural solutions, which is to promote um, economic well-being and other well-being of farmers, but at the same time, it has also unintended consequences because it could affect agriculture is not only a, um, a, 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 a beneficiary of climate, but it also could adversely impact uh, the environment around it. And we need to understand how agricultural solutions are interacting with the environment around them and uh, whether it is adversely affecting them or not. So that's the second part that will be useful for us to recognize. It is not only about climate resilience, but we also have to look at the economic, uh, sorry, economic and environmental resilience of the ecosystem around um, ag agriculture. So uh, our hope was, uh, our attempt was to look at how not only climate resilience, but also environment 
and development resilience can be built together at the same time to the extent feasible. Next slide, please. So from these broad approaches, please, the next, next slide, please. Uh, the the uh, the approaches how do they translate into methods now if you look at both we are looking at the resilience how do we measure resilience what is the method we will use and also how do we assess the human system ecosystem nexus approach um, or the how the ecosystem around the agricultural solutions are in fact affected so these are the two main parts that we will be grappled with uh, uh, that will be relevant here one thing in terms of measuring resilience, uh, we understand that at the project level, there are many measures, but it is very difficult to understand, uh, or uh, at least if I'm, um, there were many different approaches and um, uh, it will be necessary for us to understand uh, or identify a common method um, which could work across different um, uh, types of interventions. It could be a crop technology, it could be a rural finance, it could be um, and infrastructure. So among these uh, different things, how do we assess the uh, climate uh, resilience? That will be a part that we wanted to look at. And uh, one of the ways in which we wanted to do it was it should be not only relevant to EFI, but also other organizations. We should have a conversation around it. We should be having a method that those of us are working in same countries, similar regions, be able to work together and identify resilience, uh, uh, strengthening and uh, efforts and so on and so forth. So we looked at efforts which were jointly carried out, for instance, um, uh, the Rome-based agencies, WFP, FAO, uh, Food and Agricultural Organization, and if I conducted joint efforts in 2015 to analyze at the uh, resilience, what methods did they use? Now, World Bank and if I had as uh, projects in Ethiopia that look at resilience in a particular way. They are, so how are these, uh, uh, instead of inventing our own method, we wanted to see um, a, a method that can be taken up and then built upon um, across, across IFAD as well as outside as well. So we looked at the absorptive capacity, adaptive capacity and transformative capacity and so on, and develop qualitative estimates to measure them. I will not go into details, but I'm happy to answer them in the question and answer session. The other part is the uh, the, the, the uh, environmental consequences that we are uh, looking at. And we need to look at agricultural solutions and how they affect the biodiversity, soil health, land use, water and air quality, and so on and so forth. And also how agricultural solutions can build in offsets to counter some of the damages uh, that they are doing. So this is one area where we have um, you know, the expertise that is required to build qualitative approaches to consider these things. And the second part of this is the same exercise is to not only understand whether there is an uh, effect or not, but also understand the intensity of the impact uh, that is there um, and looking at to what extent um, the environment is harmed or not harmed to what extent you can restore the degraded environment or not, and so on and so forth. And what we also found is as a practical way of doing things that having a binary, did we do harm or not, doesn't help the organization because vast majority are doing harm actually. So then it will be useful for us to put them in different stages of development. And some did not even realize that, uh, that uh, uh, well, most of them recognize the climate uh, change and how, uh, how they have to protect the environment, but made no measures, no efforts whatsoever to offset some of the damage that they're doing. And some were aware and they were making some efforts, but those efforts were not doing enough to um, uh, not do harm. And then there were others who were doing a minority, they were doing um, efforts which were actually uh, doing no harm or even better. So we wanted to uh, we assess the different levels of engagement and awareness and uh, uh, efforts that they are making in order to address or mitigate the uh, environmental damage that they are doing. So when we looked at um, 20 case studies and uh, dived in deep uh, into 35 projects, it's about the fourth of IFAD's portfolio, 14% uh, 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 of IFAD's portfolio. And we also looked at the, uh, in addition to these case studies, we looked at the entire uh, projects, 230 plus projects that were uh, approved uh, during the period that we considered 2010 to 2020. 
and try to see how well they were performing. But in this focus, we found that uh, when we uh, dive deep into these um, 20 countries and looked at the 35 projects they had, it turns out that five out of the 20 were doing no harm or better. The rest are um, in the aware stage. None of them were ignoring, uh, but uh, the aware stage had various uh, various um, um, degrees of awareness. Some were closer to do no harm, some were very far away from do no harm and so on. So this is one way of qualitative way of uh, looking at how the, uh, the, the climate adaptation interventions particularly in the agricultural sector, are helping or not helping the environmental sustainability. To wrap up, there are three um, uh, um, three statements I would like to, um, which you'd be familiar, but I want to put it on a record here. It became very clear that we cannot go on um, just developing good uh, programs because good is no longer good enough. We are in a heading towards a climate catastrophe, and it is not only enough at this stage not to do no harm, but also be able to restore some of the degraded environment if we want to reverse some of the effects that are going on. So this also requires some fundamental, uh, the different ways of looking at climate adaptation solutions, which will come in a minute. And the second part is to recognize agriculture is essential to human life. But at the same time, um, agriculture also uh, is drawing from natural resources, and therefore that needs to have some kind of an offset to ensure that it is going to do no harm. So it has to be a conscious effort to, it is no, uh, the unintended consequences can be not, um, uh, they're not affordable. You, they be, should be, um, uh, may, we should recognize the unintended or intended consequences to the environment and try to mitigate them. Um, so the third part is, okay, if, even if we are aware and we are doing it, we are international uh, uh, actors, we rely on the governments uh, to uh, accept or not accept what we are proposing. So how do we convince the government that they should invest on uh, projects which are not just climate, adapted, climate resilient, but uh, they are also environmentally resilient while bringing in reducing the poverty. So we have to identify solutions that are not only um, uh, bringing in economic resilience to uh, the, their beneficiaries, but also uh, climate and environmental uh, resilience at the same time. So that was the, that will be the Effort, it is not only IFAD that has to do this, but all the organizations, when we evaluate, we need to identify solutions that can be um, used to advocate with the governments as to possibility of uh, convince them of the possibility of it is, uh, these solutions are also economically beneficial and will not uh, at the same time bring in the long-term uh, sustainability issues into uh, to bear. I, I will stop here and, um, and take questions um, later on after the other presentation. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Nanti. And yes, we'll take the questions after all three presentations. And so now I, I hand over to Luisa and Liz. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, and thank you very much, Nanti, for this extremely interesting presentation. So um let me start with uh, uh, conclusions <laughs> for one time we can skip uh, all the lengthy uh, evaluation reports and go straight to conclusions and we can move to the next slide please uh, Liz. um we conducted um, an evaluation the evaluation of fao support to sdg 313 that concluded FAO had not yet mainstreamed its work on climate action. So root causes and solutions to climate change were not being coherently addressed. Therefore, we recommended to FAO to systematically mainstream climate change into all offices division at all levels, including in our evaluations. Because one thing we found is that we are not evaluating enough. Uh, climate change. So also in, in order to be uh, to, to follow with the story with what Nancy just said, to also be vocal and start talking to governments, probably we should build a knowledge base on this, which we currently we didn't find in um, FAO's uh, organizations, uh, uh, evaluations. Considering uh, uh, I led the evaluation of SDG 13 and LIS also was an integral part of it, 
we can say that what uh, we recommended what we really strategically provided um, to uh, OED and to ourselves. So we, we look for a good reason to start working on the development of guidelines for integrating climate change into evaluations and uh, of the office uh, uh, of the FAO Office of Evaluation. So this presentation now aims to provide a broad overview of the principles of this guidelines, also of its structure. And we hope this can be, I mean, once finalized, be useful for UNIC also and members and others. Now, the guidelines are designed for an audience of evaluators. And as we saw also from the Mentimeter, I mean, some of us have I mean, uh, experience in uh, evaluating climate change and adaptation in particular in this case, um, but uh, others don't. And, uh, most of us don't have this technical background. So uh, the guidelines are thought for an audience of evaluators, as I said. So, and, uh, but we are sure that uh, we will, I mean, evaluators can follow the conceptual logic that is presented under the guidelines. And the aim of the guidelines is also to advocate for the importance of looking at climate change dimension consistently in all evaluations addressing our food systems. And obviously, we try to provide the tools to do so. The guidelines are divided in three parts. Um, we have one part where we provide the basic information about the consequences of climate act change with the focus on agri-food system. And this is obviously the advocate, uh, the part that tries to advocate also to um, for, for including uh, climate change in our evaluations. We provide the conceptual information on climate change mitigation, climate risk adaptation and resilience, and the general framework for climate change evaluation and guiding evaluation questions. So let me define also the principles of these guidelines. All interventions related to food, agriculture and nutrition affect and are affected by climate change. We also, I mean, um, can, can deduct it from, from many, in the meanwhile, I, I mean, most of us know that, but it's not so obvious when we address an evaluation when, when this is not explicitly addressed. And interventions should pave the way for transformational change of food systems by developing low carbon pathways in agriculture and building resilient food systems. So these principles are intended to make it clear that there are no neutral interventions in our food system. So when approaching an evaluation, therefore, we should consider the extent to which the intervention is in line with and contributes to the development of low carbon pathways in agriculture and to resilient food system. This is what we actually suggest to do with the guidelines. And we identify three key steps. One is defining the relevance to the climate, to climate change. The second point is understanding both dimensions of mitigation and risk adaptation and resilience. And third, decide whether climate change is a self-standing evaluation criterion or cross-cutting piece. So depending on one or the other case, we have different paths. Um, I would like to invite Liz to tell us a bit more about the instruments we are uh, using. Thank you, Luisa. So one of the key aspects of our guidelines is that they call for the integration of instruments that have been agreed at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as a key pillar to guide the evaluation of any intervention. And these instruments are the nationally determined contributions, the national adaptation plans, the biennial transparency reports, and other instruments that have been submitted to UNFCCC. And these instruments are key because they are country-led and country-owned, they are publicly available, and they contain uh, the actions that countries have committed to reduce emissions, but also they contain the adaptation needs particular to that country um, that consider the forthcoming impacts of climate change. And evaluations should um, assess whether the intervention is uh, aligned with and contribute to these UNFCCC instruments. And um, any intervention that catalyzes the link between UNFCCC instruments and laws, policies, plans, capacity development needs, investment, innovation, and partnerships 
could foster upscaling and transformational change that would lead us to achieve the 2030 agenda. And evaluations should not recommend actions that are opposed to the national pledges of emissions reductions and needs for adaptations of each country. And another key aspect of our guidelines is that uh, we uh, provide or suggest guiding evaluation questions. So after defining the climate change relevance of the intervention, this means whether climate change will be a primary aspect of the evaluation or if it will be treated as a cross-cutting theme um, across the evaluation. Um, the evaluation should consider the inclusion of climate action related evaluation questions. And in our guidelines, we suggest uh, three, um, different type of questions. One set are more general evaluation questions. Another set of evaluation questions um, is specific to each of the thematic areas of work of FAO. And um, another type of evaluation questions we suggest are for country program evaluations. And we organize these uh, questions around the OEC DAC criteria and we um, suggest the use of the concept of transformational change from the climate investment uh, fund to address the, in the root cause of uh, climate change um, in, in evaluation. And I, I give back the floor to, to Luisa. Yes, just to conclude, we did some piloting, and uh, thanks a lot, Liz, for, for this. We did some piloting, and eight colleagues from the office agreed to pilot the guidelines. Um, and we piloted and used it in project evaluations and the counter program evaluations. And uh, um, we went through all stages of the evaluation. So, for this reason, uh, it took a while. And we just collected, we've just collected the feedback, which was very encouraging. So the basically the piloting confirms the relevance and utility of this approach um, to have questions that are specific and also specific I mean, overall questions and then specific to the thematic areas of the work. Um, they confirm also the validity of linking the guidance to the UNFCCC instruments, uh, so just further improvement. Um, but this leads us also to a timeline for these guidelines. We will uh, basically, um, we are now, we can move to the next slide, uh, this just to uh, conclude. And we are, we now finalize this piloting. We will um, once finalized have an external validation and then hopefully, um, I mean, the publication um, slightly after the summer. So, uh, and we hope this will be used by at least this audience. <laughs> so, can I thanks a lot and uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you, Luisa and Lise. <laughs> and now I would like to hand over to our last presentation to Anupam. Thank you, Anna. And um, I'd like to thank you, Nanti and Luisa for, and, and Liz for setting the stage. Now I will share how special science can help address some of the challenges. So over the next few minutes, we'll uh, quickly go through what is geospatial analysis and why use geospatial uh, science in evaluation. And then what are the challenges and lessons? And, what, uh, and in the last, I'll share some resources that could be useful for the evaluators. So in this uh, photograph, we have the real world. So you can see real world is complex. It's an agricultural landscape, uh, but you have settlements, you have mountain, you have forests. And depending on the scale you look at, you could have microbes, you have soil. So we know that real world is, is complex. So what a geospatial model does, it simplifies it in different thematic layers. And these layers have one thing in common, and that is the location. So we know the location for each of these themes. And here, space becomes the container of all this information. And once we are able to arrange these thematic layers in this order, we are able to ask a lot of evaluation questions. So it allows us to look uh, at the processes, at the interaction between each other. So whether your 
agricultural expansion is affecting biodiversity, how it's affecting people. So you can look at all those processes. You can look at all those changes. You can analyze different kinds of patterns. So this allows us to answer questions on different evaluation criteria. You can, uh, we can ask question on relevance. We can ask question on sustainability. So it opens a whole new world for us. We can conduct RCT. You can conduct quasi-experimental. You can conduct qualitative analysis. And as you can see, these data, they come from, they could come from any source. It could be quantitative such as satellite data, but it could be a qualitative data such as your interviews or socioeconomic surveys. So why do we use these methods? There are several reasons for using these methods, and I have highlighted just a few. First, it helps us deal with logistical challenges because uh, this is particularly important in ruler, far off, isolated, fragile, and conflict areas, and thereby saving us important uh, evaluation resources and sometimes human resources. Uh, also, it helps us deal with methodological challenges, uh, such as lack of baseline or finding the right counterfactuals. These methods are scale agnostic. That means one can conduct an analysis at a project level, as well as at a country, a regional, or a global level. So it allows us analysis at various scale. Also, these methods are, if done well, are replicable and reproducible, and thereby they aid in objectivity and transparency. And also these are applicable uh, to variety of evaluation methods, and I will demonstrate few of uh, those in our next few slides. Uh, on top of all these, there's unprecedented flow of geospatial data, particularly from satellites, but also from all kinds of sources, your cell phone, uh, surveys, uh, et cetera. And together with that unprecedented flow of geospatial data, there's been a phenomenal growth in the analytics. So now we have cloud computers accessible uh, to anyone through their browser, which has opened up a whole new world uh, for uh, evaluators uh, to leverage uh, this um, kind of data and methods. So these are increasingly uh, being used to monitor and evaluate SDGs. So many of the uh, many of the 231 uh, SDG indicators uh, come from uh, geospatial data sources. In climate, uh, you can already see here uh, that um, some of the mitigation as well as adaptation goals of uh, the Paris Agreement is uh, mapped uh, to uh, geospatial data sources, and that includes uh, the satellite data as well. And now that we know how useful it is and what it is, uh, let me demonstrate uh, its utility using some of the examples coming out of our own evaluation at the Jeff IEO. So now I'll illustrate an example that helps us uh, understand how a geospatial science can help address a methodological challenge. And the methodological challenge I'm specifically talking about is lack of baseline. So this is Lake uh, Victoria, and you can see a lot of eutrophication that, is, that has led to uh, water hyacinth presence uh, in, in the lake. So this is a huge problem, and this is due to the agricultural practices, and this affects the livelihood of the fishers and the communities living around uh, the Victoria Basin. So there were a couple of jet projects uh, in the basin that dealt with manual uh, extraction, uh, and mechanical elimination as well. So the evaluation challenge here was that we did not have any baseline on how much vegetation was there, how did it change over a period? And this is where the satellite uh, data and geospatial analysis uh, using the satellite data came very handy. So not only we were able to uh, measure how much vegetation uh, there was uh, in the water, uh, but also we're able to create a dense time series to see how the vegetation uh, inside the, the lake changed over a period of time. And you can see there were three almost back-to-back -back 
uh, Jeff interventions together with many other interventions. Uh, and you can see where did it uh, start? So you can see the baseline, you can see uh, at the uh, beginning of the project, uh, it was already a problem, but then it peaked up in 2007. So if, if you see the shades of green and yellow, uh, that represents vegetation and vegetation everywhere is good, but not in water. So uh, here we are able to see that it increased at a particular time and then uh, eventually it starts coming down. So, you, so this demonstrate how this was useful in creating a baseline when there was none. Standalone geospatial analysis is useful. However, it works best when combined with other evaluation methods. And in our evaluations, we have used it to complement other evaluation methods as well as to uh, triangulate and validate uh, other uh, evaluative evidences. So here's a map of the distribution of Jeff land degradation uh, projects. And most of these are in uh, agricultural uh, landscape, uh, in rural areas, and mostly concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. And here we are able to combine uh, geosatellite data uh, with socioeconomic survey and we, we are able to use machine learning to process this data to answer question on impact and, and outcome. And at the same time, we are able to conduct qualitative research uh, in the field that helped us answer the why question. So for instance, uh, this uh, project in Colombia uh, focused on silva uh, pastoral uh, system. So this is uh, where the farmers were um, uh, uh, rearing cattle. Uh, but during field work, we found that what were the reasons, what was the motivation for them to sign up for greening their pastures by planting trees, uh, by uh, using live fences. So these, has, uh, so these kind of interventions have both adaptation as well as mitigation benefits, and it has livelihood uh, consequences. So we are able to combine the satellite data, socioeconomic survey, together with the field study in an evaluation. So this is a good example of a mixed uh, method analysis. I'll, and I, I would, here I would like to come back to Nanthi's point on how uh, we can also look at trade-offs. So if you increase the farmer's income, uh, does it lead to biodiversity loss? So we can assess all that with this kind of framework. It also provides valuable insights in terms of uh, what are the factors associated with the impact. So not only you're measuring impact, you're also figuring out the contextual factors, like for instance, uh, access to electricity or how much time does it take uh, to, uh, to get the maximum impact. So these are uh, the, the other kind of question that we can answer. We can an also answer question on uh, value for money, how uh, in terms of uh, the amount invested. So here's another example on how it can help us measure results and sustainability. So we know as evaluators, we do not do enough post-completion uh, evaluations due to various reasons. And this is an example uh, that um, uh, Anna, uh, my colleague here, uh, led in Rwanda. And here, uh, again, you have a watershed approach to an agricultural land, uh, landscape. The idea was to reduce uh, erosion uh, in the watershed and reduce erosion means uh, you, you'd have more uh, water in the lake. And so there were several kinds of activities such as desiltation of the lake, as well as reducing erosion in the long term. And we were able to assess right after the project started, you can see that there was increase in the lake area. And even after the project, uh, we see that the trend has remained same, although it's uh, reducing a little bit. So here it helps us a crucial answer on sustainability, whether the benefits are sustained beyond project period without spending too much of uh, our resources on post-completion uh, evaluations. It's very useful for rapid and ex-ante uh, evaluations uh, as well. And here uh, we looked at the impact of lockdown on uh, the socioeconomic conditions using nighttime light as a proxy in African uh, protected areas. And we found that 75% of the protected area saw a decrease in socioeconomic activities as seen by the nighttime light data. Uh, this was validated by uh, the cell phone data that Google 
uh, made available during the time of COVID. So you can see uh, uh, before, after, and it affected all the protected areas because there was no tourism and thereby, uh, and therefore no uh, tourism based activity in and around African protected area. So this is uh, also very useful for uh, evaluations on disaster risk recovery uh, in conflict uh, mitigation uh, evaluations. And also these methods allow us ex ante uh, assessment. And this is very uh, important because we know adaptation and mitigation is very challenging uh, to evaluate in a short time frame. And here again, ex ante evaluation can be conducted using geospatial method uh, to address these challenge. And in this example, you see that not only we're able to measure carbon sequestration or land use change within uh, the current time frame, but we're also able to uh, predict it for 2030, which is the alliance with the SDG goal. Uh, so, uh, so there are certain lessons that we have learned uh, using these methods in our evaluation. Uh, so first is the partnership. And uh, these kind of methods uh, need partnerships, uh, joint evaluation, bringing in experts from various disciplines. Uh, and in IO, we have collaborated with Aid Data, we have collaborated with NASA for this kind of work. Also, these, uh, like any method, uh, geospatial is not the silver bullet. It works best in a mixed method uh, framework, and I have already demonstrated that. Also, we have to be considerate of you know, data risk, uh, <laughs> the ethical and legal consideration. Uh, the cost is variable depending on uh, the scope and the tools you're using, whether open source, what kind of expertise, what kind of question you're asking. And finally, I would like to um, uh, end with the note uh, that uh, we need to see evaluation as a dynamic learning process because every day there would be new method, new satellite, new algorithm, chat GPT and whatnot. But as evaluators, we need to keep up with the dynamic learning process and with that, um, I would like to share some resources available on our website. So thank you everyone for your attention and uh, thank you, UNIC, uh, for helping us organize this uh, webinar. Over to you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Anna Palm. And as our director would say, that's, that's some really cool stuff that is really helpful for evaluations. Very good. We've, we've heard from our presenters. We've heard about some evaluative evidence in agriculture. We've heard about the development of guidelines, plus these new technologies for evaluations. Uh, so I would like to start the question and answer session now. We have several questions uh, in the chat, and uh, maybe we should start with um, one or two of those. They might be in order uh, of presentation of uh, presenters. Um, the first one is, I think, for Nanti. To what extent is an assessment of the potential environmental damage built into the pre-approval assessment process? And then there's a second question: What were the criteria under each category of the nexus approach? Uh, Nanti, would you like to respond to those? Of course, uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, uh, I think they are very pertinent and uh, useful to follow up. Um, in terms of the uh, guidance uh, to design so that uh, the environmental consequences can be addressed at the very early stage itself by the, by the intervention. If I did develop a, uh, 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 it's called social environmental climate assessment procedures, made it mandatory for all projects that if there is a climate risk identified or environmental risk identified, it has to carry out that assessment. And uh, that uh, incidentally, um, you would also see from the graph I presented, um, the problems continued even after it was introduced. That is probably because it is too complex an exercise to capture everything through a guidance and prevent them from happening. You may be worried about, let us say, not using pesticides, but you can end up drawing from a closed aquifer. Uh, so uh, the, the, the kind of, it's a complex uh, uh, nexus, becomes a complex exercise. 
and very uh, unless there is a devoted expertise and so on to make sure that we understand the environmental consequences, it'll be difficult. So I'll be uh, so in that sense, and also. I want to highlight an interesting point here. If you look at the, uh, the graph again, I don't have it in front of me, but there were 20 projects, five were doing no harm or better, four of them were uh, designed before the SACEP was introduced. That means there are people who are aware without any guidance needed uh, that there are situations which uh, should be avoided and they avoided it successfully without any guidance. So it, is, it also brings to us the need for designers or the people who can design programs thinking through issues uh, solidly. The second part in terms of nexus criteria, I'm not sure of the question, but that is a very pertinent point because it is we do not claim to have mastered this. We are scratching the surface, starting it. And uh, Andy Rowe, who uh, developed that with us, is now taking it in the uh, part of the footprint evaluation, part, uh, which is part of a global um, uh, evaluation initiative. Uh, so there, we are trying to build this, take it to a next level. But initial uh, idea was this. We sat down with different experts, looked at the project, and analyzed what it was doing. Let us say, case by case, uh, what is it doing to the land use? What is it doing to the air quality? What is it doing to the natural resources around it? So, And then discussed how well it was doing. And then we not only looked at a project, we looked at multiple projects to be able to assess the rating that we give or the assessment that we give to contextualize and so on and so forth. So it was a qualitative process, but through a dialogue with the stakeholders and with the team to understand what are the different parts. Uh, let us say if, uh, again, the example I gave was the first thing that we check is where are they drawing the water from and so on and so forth. Is it closed aquifers? Uh, how, what is the impact on uh, the, 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 the water quality, soil quality and so on? So that was a qualitative approach, dimension by dimension. We couldn't cover all the dimensions. Biodiversity, for instance, we couldn't. Uh, so it is a starting point, um, and it is a path to proceed, um, uh, uh, proceed uh, building on what we have. But I'm sure there is a lot more to be done there. Thank you, Nanti. Then there's another question for Anupam. What software do you use for the geospatial analysis? Is it Agris? Thank you, Anna. Uh, I've already answered that question in the chat box, but I'll just say that, yes, uh, we have ArcGIS available, but it's very uh, expensive. Uh, I personally prefer QGIS or uh, coding uh, in R or Python, uh, but yes, ArcGIS uh, latest version is really good if you have access to it. Yeah, Daniel asked two questions, and, and, and these are interlinked. I think they are connected, and it's about practices, whether we learn more about practices, so farmers' practices and not interventions, and, um, and also the, the, the question on indigenous people. Now, um, I don't know what Nanti has to say on this. Unfortunately, what I can say on this is that there is very little that at the moment, at the all knows about that uh, simply because um, at, at least we found very little to uh, to our evaluation which had a very high score which, which was a, a, an SDG level evaluation so didn't really look at the single interventions but more at a higher level at the same time we found there is not sufficient um, let's say knowledge on this and that more should be done on this on this side so we had a dedicated recommendation in this sense at the same time i see that i mean um, maybe there is something that can be found on specific platforms like um the 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 local platform on indigenous people it's a web portal where there might be some uh, well shuddling there might be some uh, some experiences from different agencies that um, were shared there I want to take up uh, this uh, this opportunity to raise a connected issue that they raised, and then a couple of people followed up on that. Catherine, we are interested in making sure, from project level to whatever level that we are considering, the environmental consequences are tracked. At the same time, we realize that if you are looking at, let us say, IFAD's projects, different agencies have different scale of projects. World Bank may have a whole region as a project. But for us, when we talk about a project, it is a couple of farms here and there. And that makes it difficult for us to understand fully what is uh, happening at the landscape level, which is what is relevant to us when we look at the ecosystem effects. 
Now, the, 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 the point that uh, we also noticed was when they were successful, the do-no-harm projects, they were all nature-based and they were at a landscape level and they were participatory. Uh, so these were some of the some of the uh, the criteria that comes uh, or not criteria per se, but some lessons that we draw from watching only IFAD and see what is working uh, uh, there. Uh, so it is quite possible to have projects, even though not all projects will be there, that do cover landscape level parts. And it is I agree with the assessment that it is not only important for us to look at what is happening at the landscape level, but also at the policy level how the uh, the dynamic works how these solutions inform the policy and how the policy informs these solutions as well ultimately you have to convince the government no amount of push from the international actors will succeed if there is no active contribution from the government so it is essential for us to convince the government that these solutions not only solve poverty but also they solve poverty in a sustainable way and that is more important than just solving poverty thank you nanti Okay, let me start uh, with showing some of um, your answers. So um, the main takeaways are geospatial analysis, complex analysis, the need to assess environmental impact in all our activities, triangulation of data keeps on being important, Criteria for future evaluation, more evidence is required at macro level. How important just spatial analysis is in triangulating qualitative climate evidence. Thank you for emphasizing the need to focus on assessing coherence of the climate action. Great work, inspiring, thank you very much. Methodology, the use of GIS for evaluations, landscape analysis, need to investigate maladaptation. Absolutely, I completely agree with that comment. More needs to be done to understand whether climate interventions are improved adaptive capacity, especially for farmers. Absolutely, GIS for analysis. Recommendation, no, on the first column again. Recommendation to align with country commitments. Using quantitative and qualitative methods, need to use mixed methods and incorporate cultural models in uh, evaluation frameworks. Going from mixed methods to mixed approaches. Uh, thank you for emphasizing the need. Okay, that, that one I read. The challenge of assessing climate resilience environmental impact in a system that operates at such a wide scale, farm to policy level and everything in between, but that is important to do so. It is a collective challenge among evaluators, so let's harness our ideas and strengths and continue this discussion. Complexity of integrating climate change in evaluation. Looking forward to the guidelines. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Liz. That really uh, summarizes uh, these great takeaways. Uh, I would like to add that it's so important for all the outcomes of the work that we do, climate resilience affects those outcomes. And we really need to take, the, take that into account in implementation and also in our evaluations. So with that, I'd like to thank the panelists, and I would also like to thank all the participants for their active participation.